So on this week's video, I originally wanted to do a follow-up on last week's topic, which is the resin strength versus filament. Um, I was testing whether resin was actually isotropic or not. That is, whether it's just as strong in all three directions that you could print parts in. But there were some unexpected findings, so I'm doing a few extra tests just to make sure I'm, I'm covering everything and I'm, I'm doing my tests properly. So today we're actually going to talk about something entirely different. We're going to talk about, you guessed it, drag chain and wire management in general, a few things that manufacturers do well, that could be done better, that are done horribly on some machines. As you can see behind me, we're gonna be looking at those. And yeah, a few tips on how to use drag chains and on how you can get nearly the same result with a lot cheaper materials, if you use them right. So drag chains obviously are a staple of industrial machines, robot, and anything else that is like heavy duty and properly designed. We started seeing them on 3D printers too, but they're not always used right. In fact, sometimes the way they're being used is worse than not using a drag chain at all. So these drag chains serve about four basic purposes. And I'm looking at my notes here because I don't have a script today. First, they keep your wires and everything else you put into these, like hoses, etc. They keep all those in a constrained space. So for example, on this Z-axis, um, there is this box that the drag chain can move in. This can move up and down. And it's never going to exceed that volume. It's always going to stay within that, uh, that bounding box, essentially. So you can be sure that anything you design around that is not going to collide with wires and your wires are not going to get caught. The second one is, you know, probably not that necessary for 3D printers, and that is to protect your wiring from the elements, which is weather, UV radiation, uh, chemicals, if you have a harsh environment. So not really relevant here, but you can get these as a closed version um, that is almost sealed off. Then of course, the most important job is to provide a minimum bend radius for your cables and strain relief. That's two very different features, obviously. So let's start with the bend radius. If you have a wire that is being bent at a very small radius, essentially you're kinking it in that spot. And if you keep bending it like this, or even if you keep bending it like that, which is arguably worse, um, it is going to fail much quicker than if you bend it in a much larger radius. Obviously this one already has kinks, so it doesn't really roll smoothly, but I think you, you see what I'm, what I'm saying here. So essentially, if you have a, a cable, if you put it in a drag chain with a small radius or you have it kinking in always the same position uh, in use, then that cable is going to fail much faster and much earlier than if you put it in a nice large radius uh, drag chain like that. So that really keeps your, your wires from breaking prematurely. And lastly, feature number four in these drag chains, it keeps your wires neatly lined up if you choose to use these separators. But in general, it keeps these wires from tangling with each other um, and just keeps them neatly organized so they can smoothly roll in these drag chains. Now, of course, you could properly design these drag chains and I've, I've tried to do that as properly, I guess, not here, but I've tried to do as proper of a job with these drag chains on the Mendel 9000, my, my test platform, which still isn't finished after years of, of it sitting there. Uh, I've tried to do things as properly as possible. You can go through the entire design process. I just have a really good online configurator for drag chains and also their cables, um, where you input things like how fast you're accelerating your moving part, how fast it's gonna go, how many cycles it's gonna do in an hour, uh, how long your drag chain is, because that, that matters for how long your lever is, how much weight you put in there, all that. In the case of 3D printers, really, we're not at that level yet, where you need to design these parts so well that you're worried about the a drag chain wearing out or something like that. We really need to work on like the low level basic stuff. If we don't even get the low level stuff right, then everything else kind of becomes irrelevant. So what are those basic things that you should keep in mind with a drag chain or in general, any sort of wire guide at all? Well, first of all, like I mentioned, a large radius is always better than a small radius. Uh, yes, you do end up using a bit of extra cable, but your wires are just gonna last much, much longer if you give him a larger radius. And also a thinner cable can get away with a much smaller bend radius than something as thick as these uh, chain flex cables, which are the Igo specific, uh, they're, well, they're low grade 
drag chain wires. So these actually need a bit more of a bend radius to last the same time and the same amount of cycles than this smaller cable. Well, this isn't the drag chain cable, but if you, you get my point. If you're using the same grade of small and large wire, then the smaller one will get away with a smaller bend radius. And also, of course, the same cable will just last longer in a larger bend radius. Next, leave some space in these drag chains. Don't fill them to the brim, don't fill them up so tightly that the cables in here have no room to move, because these need to be able to glide inside the drag chain ever so slightly. Um, I mean, ideally, this should be a constant length, but there's always some movement. This isn't a perfect circle, of course, that you're bending these in, so there needs to be some slack also, you know, these cables shouldn't be pulled tight inside a drag chain. They also shouldn't be pushed in so that they rub up against the outside of the drag chain. Just keep them nice and, and somewhat loose in there and also leave some space uh, vertically so they can actually move around. And to make sure that you're not like accidentally messing up that balance in your application and you actually end up pulling one side tight, which again is gonna have the uh, your cable rubbing on the drag chain, your cable should be tied down on both ends of your drag chain. With these eye distractions that I'm using here, there's actually a special end part that has these, these little nubs here that you can pull a zip tie around. And the same up here, of course, this is tied down on both ends. And yeah, that's just gonna keep it nice and balanced at a point where the cable isn't super tight or super loose, it's just perfect. Now, the cables that you're using um, do matter a lot too in how long they're gonna last. We've talked about this in the Raptor review where they're using that, that rather large and coarse wire with a textile insulation uh, that is used for those silicone heater mats inside a drag chain, which is like the absolute worst type of cable you could use. Maybe solid core wire would be even worse, but um, in general, these cables, these drag chain cables, these aren't that special, especially these, these low grade um, or like entry level CF-130s that I've got from IGAS. Uh, these are regular PVC cables. I mean, they're not great for high temperature or high strain, high speed applications, but I'm, I'm just gonna say from that, if you have something like a regular CAD5 Ethernet cable, I think this is, yeah, this is CAD5. These should be okay in a drag chain, in like a reasonable lifetime expectancy for a 3D printer if you give it some bend radius. You will wear out a lot of other parts on your 3D printer before you wear out your cabling if you constrain it right, either large radius drag chain or some of the other methods that we're gonna get to in a second. In general, if you're looking for a cable, try to use as small of a cable as possible. Again, like I mentioned, this, this is gonna last longer than the thicker ones. Uh, make sure it is smooth and can glide along a drag chain if you're using a drag chain well. Uh, always make sure it gets as large of a bend radius as possible. Make sure it doesn't kink in one single position. We're actually gonna get to that in a second. And yeah, you should actually be able to use maybe not this, type of a, of a tiny radius drag chain, but like a, a slightly smaller version with regular wiring as well. And I think the load spot actually does that and that is a, a very good solution. So yeah, what are some of the alternatives to drag chains that we could be using? Because again, these are, these can get bulky if you use them right. Um, and also they're, they're kind of expensive. There are lots of individual plastic components and that does add up in cost. So let's go through those, well, three relevant features of drag chains one by one and see how these alternatives fare. Number one, constraining your cables to a defined space. We've got the, the good old spiral wrap, we've got mesh sleeving, we've got the slit open conduit that is being used on the Atom 3D printer, and all of these actually do a good job of, you know, at least keeping single wires from, from poking out and constraining your wire bundle to the inside of whatever your wrap is. Of course, you're still gonna have to take action to kind of constrain that wire bundle to where you want it to go. Next, strain relief and a minimum bend radius. And, you know, this is really the only one of these three that is gonna give you some extra rigidity and is gonna protect your wires from getting kinked and, and bent too tightly because this does have, you know, that this naturally kind of wants to bend in a larger radius. Uh, spiral wrap doesn't really do anything. It doesn't add rigidity and mesh sleeving also doesn't do much. These do add some rigidity and, and help with the wires bending in a larger radius, but by themselves, these don't help that much with kinking in one single spot. 
And that kinking is, first of all, important in, well, the bundle itself, but more importantly, at the interface where you're sleeving ends and contacts to a, a fixed point. Actually, let me pull up the, uh, let me pull up this one. So on the Ender 3, they've actually done a good job with that um, back here where they used a sleeve, then some sort of a textile wrap, and then have this little snout at the back here that kind of guides the wire so that it doesn't bend at the loose wire, at the naked wire in here, but bends at a position where it is reinforced and is a bit more rigid against uh, the, that, that kink in this one spot. Prusa actually do a very similar thing where they have the mesh sleeving on the outside and then a piece of filament just kind of reinforcing that bundle and, and forcing it into a larger radius. So these are both better solutions than not having any reinforcement there. Because again, if this one spot is not reinforced then everything else like mesh sleeving or, or you know conduit or whatever stops mattering entirely. So since we already have the uh, CR10 up on the table here, let's start looking at what it does well and what it doesn't do so well. Um, and I do want to compare it against the CR10 because while they are very similar printers, uh, but they do have a few key differences that makes one a bit better than the other. So I guess like the first thing we can see is that the CR10 uses this external control box with just wiring all over the place. That is not a, a great start um, because you, you don't get a constrained, a, a defined position of, you know, like the moving y-axis wire right here. Also, if you compare that one spot right there, the CR10 does not have that little extra snout there that would, you know, kind of strain relief this little spot right there. So any movement of the y-axis, especially if it's, it's, if it's sideways like that, is going to bend the wire in that one spot repeatedly. Again, on the CR10, Got the little plastic reinforcement bit, so that is a bit more well constrained. On the extruder, both of these actually do a reasonably good job because they use the principle of tying their wire bundle to something that is rigid. So they've got the Bowden tube right here that is rigidly coupled to the extruder and to the tool head, so that reinforces just that moving part of the wire. Of course, there's still going to be some bending there, but that really keeps it in a nice and smooth curve, which is Great. On the z-axis, there is no strain relief, so yeah, that's that's not too great. Now, I can forgive that on the z-axis because this is not going to see that much movement, but in general, if you see any sort, or if the wiring can bend a connector like that, or, or wires going straight into a connector, that is a bad sign because these crimps are already a weak point in the wire, and if you add motion to that, that's exactly where they're going to fail. This is okay for the z-axis, I can forgive it, but of course I would prefer seeing this wire just being tied down to the moving part like that, so we now get a you know, nice bending action right there and not right against the connector. That's the CR10, let's actually compare the Ender 3 against Anet's kind of rival to the Ender 3. Uh, they tried to produce a... Ender 3 competitor clone. Of course, they try to have it look the same, but in the end, it is a vastly different machine. Again, first difference is they've got the external control box, so already a bunch of, of wiring mess. On the Z-axis, they've actually got a very similar thing with just the wires going into the connectors without any sort of strain relief, and you can already see how much that bounces around. For the extruder, though, they do have the wire with the mesh sleeving going all the way up to the extruder, but you can see there is there is like no strain relief there at all. So as this moves back and forth, this bit right there is just going to keep kinking back and forth. There is no reinforcement, unlike with the CR10 where it is tied to the Bowden tube. So that kind of keeps it from, from kinking, whereas on the ANET E10 they are actually reinforcing that kinking action because they're adding that piece of shrink wrap which is basically like a rigid lever that keeps pulling on these wires right down there. So this is not a, a great solution. I guess this should just be tied to the Bowden tube, but then you, you, are running out of, uh, you are running out of wire length. So yeah, not fantastic. Also on the bed back here, uh, this is a similar issue than on the CR10. There is no strain relief on this connector at all. And again, you've got the wires bending in the connector itself. And also these connectors, where they're soldered to this uh, heater PCB, that's where they often break and you know how it is with ANET. When wires break then you do end up with an unpleasant outcome. And lastly the LoadSpot Mini. Unfortunately LoadSpot did go out of business 
Maybe it's because they spend too much money on doing things properly because this is wiring wise, it's a really good printer. Let's start up here with the ZX's drag chain, Igus, Igus drag chain actually. That's great to see and it is a rather large radius. For the ZX's it doesn't matter that much again because this doesn't see that much motion. For the X-axis we've got the same style drag chain, actually one with a, with a larger bend radius, we're a bit more relaxed here. And that does work really well. It does give the wires um, a nice gentle curve to bend around. Uh, and the way they've positioned it by using the very top of the extruder carriage down to the very bottom of the carriage, they've got plenty of space to account for that large radius. Now, of course, you can see I've already you know, messed with this printer because this has uh, a prototype Titan Arrow on it. It's still a nice little printer, but... Um, yeah, doing things with drag chains and all, I guess, turned out to be a bit too expensive uh, to maintain because for the price of one mini, I think you could buy like six 888s. And of course, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty hard sell if you don't know what to look for. All right, so that's it for today. A quick little video. I hope you still enjoyed it and got some useful information out of it. Um, maybe keep an eye out for these sorts of sins with wiring and strain relief on your next printer pick or on your next printer build. Maybe you can do a better job of keeping uh, your wires happy and yourself safe from electrical fires because that's exactly how those get created. Anyways, thank you for watching. Make sure you get subscribed right there and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.